Uh, let me make a couple of announcements real quick. This Thursday, we have overcomers from 6 to 8, and we've got a young man coming. If you saw the broadcast a few weeks ago, I interviewed a young man by the name of Nicholas Simmons. I talked about it uh, here. He, man, his mama and daddy were praying for him. He, he'd gotten into drugs. He was starting to run drugs for the cartel. He was looking at 17 years in prison, and he thought about running, and his dad told him, you can't run. And he ended up serving four months, and God just dramatically turned his life around. He had an encounter with God. He's going to be coming and sharing his testimony this, I mean, this Thursday at 6. So even if you're not a part of Overcomers, come on out to listen to that and support him. And uh, I know it'll be a blessing to him and you as well. Also, Kat mentioned we're leaving for Lynch a week from tomorrow. And so today we're asking you, we need 70 people to take bags and fill up with personal hygiene items that we'll be giving to uh, women at a women's center. You know, a little, a, a thing of lotion may not mean much to you, but for a lady that doesn't have any at all and uh, is trying to get her life together, what that means is that somebody thought about her, somebody cares about her, and we want them to know that we do care about them and love them. So let's give God a big hand clap of praise for that. <clears throat> also, just on a couple of side notes, I want you praying. Uh, that I believe that God's starting to open up some doors, and we're looking to be able to expand ministry. How many of you know that ministry's got to happen outside these four walls? And we're blessed every week uh, with our praise and worship team bringing us into the presence of God. In October of this year, it looks like we're going to be able to go and do another uh, Christian concert in Lynch with the Women's Center there. And now uh, we've got one set up in August in Hot Springs for a Women and a Men's Center there. So be praying that lives will be changed and God will just use the church to have an impact everywhere. Amen. Turn, and uh, if you know of a place that needs ministered to, let us know. All right? Right now, this place needs ministered to. So that's what we're going to do. If you have your Bibles, open up with me to the book of Hebrews, the fourth chapter. I was... This past week, uh, I was reading the scripture, and I was thinking about this and the implication of what God was saying to us in uh, Hebrews 4, starting with verse 1. Let's read this, and we're going to talk about this. It says, God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For only we who believe can enter into his rest. As for the others, God said, in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. Even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God as the people of Israel did, we will fall. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We just ask you, God, to minister to us today. Father, let me decrease so you can increase. I pray, God, that you transform hearts. Father, that you ignite a fire in our soul that will cause us to become who you intended for us to be. We thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to speak to you for just a while, a, a little bit today on when you can't turn it off. Everybody say that with me. When you can't turn it off, put it to rest. Say it one more time. When you can't turn it off, put it to rest. How many of you have ever been trying to sleep at night and your mind is going 100 miles an hour? You know what I'm talking about? And you're, you're, laying, and you're thinking, man, this used to be the, the, the worst time for me when this happened to me was right before a mission trip. Like I, I, I would be, I, I'd have so much stuff that I had on a checklist. You do not know how many dreams I had that I showed up to the airport going to Russia and forgot my passport. 
man, it just breaks you out in a sweat, you know. And then for Mexico, when we were going to Mexico, it was always, did I get this? Do I have this in the trailer? And it was a checklist. And I'm telling you, I could not, and I needed to go to sleep because I was going to drive the next morning. Kim, it's so good to see you here. Let's give God a grand, hand, big hand clap for Kim. I didn't see her earlier, but Kim went through a car accident. We're glad she's here with us, and uh, God kept her through that. But I, I, I just, man, I, I, and you know, then you start watching the clock. How many of you have ever done that? You know, you look at what time is it? How much time do I have to sleep? And it's like, man, and it's just, and it, uh, and you wake up completely worn out because you couldn't get rest. You couldn't shut it off. Everybody say shut it off. I remember working in a factory and when I, I went to work, we, they, they had this armor line where what would happen is the uh, wire, the copper wire went through this machine and it wrapped steel around it. It was called armor cable. And I was pulling 12 hour days and a lot of those days were uh, six, well, we went like 28 days without a day off. And a lot of those days were 12 hour days and then just breaking that cable and running it and checking it and I'll never forget going to bed one night and dreaming all night long that I was running that cable then I woke up in the morning and had to go to work and run that cable and I thought are you kidding me I've been running cable all night long and now I've got to go do it again and so there's something that gets taken away from us when our mind can't shut down. And so when you can't turn it off, you have to learn how to put it to rest. The scripture I read about, the writer of Hebrews is talking about the, the children of Israel having come out of Egypt. He talks about this rest that God had promised, but then he said, but God swore, he said that they'll never experience that rest. And there's a reason that they don't experience that rest, and the reason is because of their disobedience. Everybody say disobedience. And, and so if, if we let this stuff go on in our head, it eventually gets in our heart. And when it gets in our heart, it begins to cause us to doubt. We begin to fear, and then all this unbelief begins to grip us. Look, they had seen God take out the strongest nation on the face of the earth. They saw it with their own eyes. Man, can you imagine having been there when the Red Sea rolled back? I mean, who wouldn't want a front row seat to that? Yeah, to think about, you know, we read this stuff, but if we're not careful, we don't let it, we, we don't let it be real to us. I remember the first trip I made to Israel. And I got to the Mount of Beatitudes, and I stood there, and I looked out over that sea, and in my mind, I started going there. And I thought, he stood here. And, and I, I remember saying, it can't get any better than this. But then I was in the garden tomb. And I thought it, and it just kept increasing and increasing because what was happening is all the cares of life got shut out of my mind. And for a moment of time, I went to that place with him. There were the stairs that he walked up on his way to cave. I know we weren't supposed to walk on him, but I'm thinking, I can't help it. I needed to just walk. I needed to just stand where he had stood. And I tried to think what was going through his mind. He knew what was going to happen to him. He knew what he was going to face. And that's why he didn't sleep that night. But they did. <laughs> Isn't it odd that if it's not your problem, how it doesn't bother you? Matter of fact, what do we say today? What, what's one of the big phrases today? Sounds like a personal problem to me. You know, what's that really saying? It's saying, hey, I don't care. That's your problem. What you have to understand about Israel, and when you read the Bible, it's important for you to understand this, 
that God dealt with that nation conglomerately. One man by the name of Achan, one man messed up when it came to attacking Jericho. One man, nobody else had done it, but one man caused an entire nation to fail. Why? Why is God doing that? Why is God singling out one man and showing how that it caused Israel to, com to completely lose out in the battle? It's because God is trying to show us the impact of sin in our life. That it doesn't just affect us individually, but it affects everybody connected to us. When you he read a horrendous story that somebody went into some place and they, they shot up a Walmart or they went in and they did some horrific act, do you realize that in that one story that we get in like 30 seconds on the news, what they don't tell you is that every life that was connected to the individual that made that, that did that act has now been devastated and it's long, it's, it, it is long reaching and it's going out. And what God was saying to Israel is this, is I have a promise for each and every one of you. This isn't about, oh, I get to go because I'm good and I get to go. It, it's kind of like this. It's a football team either wins together or they lose together you either it, 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 you, you ever seen a what was a I can't remember the name of the show but if, if your front line is not blocking for you then it doesn't matter how good of a quarterback you are you're going to get creamed every time there's a snap because they're not doing what they need to do Israel had seen the power of God on display personally. They had watched it happen. And now as they're wandering, 11 days turns into 40 years. An 11-day journey to get to the promised land turned into a 40-year trek across the wilderness. Why? Because they couldn't shut it off. They see God roll the Red Sea back. Three days later, they're griping about nothing to drink. I mean, isn't it just possible? Isn't there a slight probability that the God that rolled back an entire sea could give you something to drink? But you don't see anywhere. There's no place where it's recorded that three days later when there's no, nothing to drink, there's no place recorded that the people called for a prayer meeting and started praying and fasting. I'm telling you, do not underestimate the power of prayer in your life. When you make up your mind, instead of, instead of complaining or instead of falling into fear, I choose to pray and I'm going to trust God. Joe made the statement. He said, though he slay me, yet I'll trust him. I, I'm not going to let the devil take me out. I, I'm not going to let him get in my head. I, I'm going to put it to rest right here, right now. Put it to rest. They couldn't put it to rest. They kept bringing it up. Oh, you know, they kept complaining and complaining and complaining. And then after they go into the promised land, after they see that, that I'll never forget I, the, first time, the first trip I made into the Middle East. I was in Jordan. And I, I, I looked across. I was coming off. I was, I, I was in Amman, Jordan. I was coming over a hill. And I could see the Jordan Valley. And I'm telling you, the sun was shining. And rays of light were beaming down into that valley. And I looked at that in that moment of time because I was up on that high spot. I thought about Moses and I thought, oh, Moses, what was it like for you to look over at it and to know that you can't go into it? I don't want to be on the edge of God's breakthrough for us and then be told you can't go because you're not holding me up. Somebody give me a roll of duct tape. Because sometimes 
I just need to rip a piece off. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Sometimes I just need to. Don't you wish you had a mute button for yourself? And God had control of it, and you said, God, anytime I'm saying something I ought not be saying, just hit mute, and I'd be mute. Okay, yeah, praise God, hallelujah, and I think that part. You know what I'm talking about? It'd be like, man, we would be so tired of living in that, that, uh, I hate, I'm trying to be politically correct here, but you know, that Chinese cinema. You know what I'm talking about? Where the words and the lips don't match. Out of sync. Thank you. Out of sync. Everybody say out of sync. You ever see something out of sync before? And it's like something don't look. Look, something happened to our broadcast one time, and I'm watching myself out of sync. And that is weird, folks. It's like, yeah, and then we're going, yeah. You know, and it's like, what is going on? And it's, we got, everybody say, get in sync. Every once in a while, you need to get your head where your heart's at. Get in sync. You know, when they needed an answer to a question, do you know which disciple they asked Jesus to ask the question to? They went to the guy who had his head where the heart was. They went to John because John's head was laying on the heart of Jesus. He loved him, and he said, if anybody can get an answer, John can. I'm telling you, if you want an answer, get your head where the heart's at. Put it to rest. Everybody say, put it to rest. They, they went into the promised land. They experienced everything that God said was there. They're raising their children in this land of freedom. I traveled into Mexico and saw the poverty of Mexico. And I understand the problem with the border. How, how do you understand the problem with the border? I understand it from this aspect. Because if I was living in Mexico, I'd spend every day of my life trying to get across the border. Doesn't make it right, doesn't make it legal. I'm just telling you the way it is. I, wa I didn't watch. I, I heard of mothers taking their babies and shoving them through the fence and, getting, and leaving them on the other side of that fence because they felt like that's the only hope that child's ever going to have is on the other side of it. We have to understand that the only hope we have is in Christ. It's on the other side of Calvary. If, you don't, if, you, if you're trying to live on this side of Calvary, on the side of the law, you get stoned for picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. It's not going to work out for me. I need to be on the other side of Calvary, and I've got to let all my doubts and all my fears, I'm talking about the day that we're living in. How many of you watch the news and get really mad? Anybody? How many of you just chose not to watch the news? I'm not going to watch it anymore, man. I just, you know, you want a bad day? Turn on the news. Oh, praise zippity doo -da. Oh, man, that's horrible. And it, it, will, it will rob you if, of your peace if you let it. But if you keep things in perspective and understand, look, the Bible said that there's some things that are going to happen and he's going to come back. So maybe what we ought to do is be looking at the news a little bit different and say, man, we're getting close to home going time. We're, we're getting close to it. I, I don't know when it's coming, but I know it's coming. And somebody say, get excited about it. So they, they, they see the promise, they see everything that's going on, and they choose to complain they begin to disobey God and they lose out with him if we allow if we allow it our thoughts and fears can turn into doubt and unbelief now this is what Romans 14 and 23 says about it that it says whatsoever is not of faith 
is sin. Say it with me. Whatsoever is not a faith is sin. See, we don't think about that when all of a sudden we're going through something and we begin to question, well, I don't know if God's going to take care of this or not. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. How many of you ever caught yourself sinning and didn't even realize you were sinning? Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So when you're facing something and you're wringing your hands and you're beginning to give a voice to your fears and your doubts, it's sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And if you keep speaking it and you keep declaring it, sooner or later that's going to turn into unbelief and unbelief is going to become disobedience to God. He promises us rest. Everybody say rest. Look what he said. He said that God's promise of entering his rest still stands. It's, it's been there since the beginning of the world. It still stands. What does the word rest mean? Now, I'm not talking about a rest in eternal after we, we die. I'm talking about there's a rest that God wants us to have right here, right now. Everybody say it right here, right now. The word rest means lying down or placing confidence in. Say that with me. I have confidence. It comes from a word that means to settle down, to cause to cease and desist, to abide and stay in one place. Everybody say one place. Sometimes folks are saying, I don't know why God can't bless me. Maybe because he can't find you. <laughs> Settle down. Get in one place. Listen, do you have, any of you ever have your parents say this to you? You better settle down back there. Did you ever hear that? What did that mean to you? I can tell you what it meant to mean, cease and desist. What was he saying? He's saying, it was dad's way of saying, you better knock that mess off in that back seat or I'm getting ready to knock somebody out of that back seat. Cease and desist. Settle down. Any of you ever get in trouble? You know? Were you ever, were you ever told by your parents, if you don't stop that, you're getting a spanking. How many of you did it anyway? <laughs> Help! <laughs> what do you, I saw hands go up all over this building. You say, mine went up too. Until my parents made a believer out of me. I found out that he wasn't kidding. <laughs> you do that again, and I'm going, oh, he ain't going, what, pow! I told you. How many of you have ever heard that? I told you. And so what happens is there are some parents, how many of you have ever been in a grocery store, and you see people in there with their kids, and their kids are acting up? Let, let me share something with you. There were five of us. And when we went to the store, we, people commented to our dad all the time, said, your children are so well-behaved. We knew what was coming if we weren't. <laughs> I don't know if it's well-behaved or living in fear. <laughs> but I, what, I, what I'm saying is this, is if we went into the store, dad told us, he said, you keep your hands at your side and don't you touch anything. So we're walking around like this. It's the land of the living dead. No, it's walking, walking, around, walking around with our hands down by our side. And I'll never forget, man. How many of you know that there's little hairs on the back of your neck? My dad had this gift of being able to get a hold of those. 
I, I reached up. I, was, I didn't even know he was anywhere around. I reached up one time. There was just this thing calling me on a shelf. It was like it had my name on it, come to me. And I, I, I reached up, and I, I'm reaching up, and I go out to touch it. And I promise you, man, I no sooner touched that than I felt my dad get a hold of those hairs on the back of my neck, and it felt like he lifted me about six inches out of my shoes. And he said, I told you not to touch anything. Okay, just put me down. See, here's the thing is that if you don't believe what has been said to you, you're not going to pay any attention to it. So I've been in stores before and heard parents saying, put that down. Put that, they're yelling as loud as the kids are. Put that down. You put that down. I'm going to tear you up, boy. You better put that down. You don't touch that. You don't do that. I'm going to. Has anybody been in that same store with me? And it goes on and on and on. Man, I'm telling you, there have been times I felt like taking my belt off and handing it to them and saying, would you just go ahead and do what you said you're going to do because they don't believe you. Right. <laughs> how many of you know that God knows how to make a believer out of you? God knows that. Listen, when God's saying you're supposed to rest, he knows how to make a believer out of you. He'll set it up that if you don't want to listen to him, if you don't want to rest, he puts you in a place where you're going to have to rest. Everybody say, don't do it the hard way. Just, just listen to what he's saying. Let him take care of it. For you don't let your faith waver. Stay in that place of confidence with God. Settle down your fears and worries and rest in his presence and his word. If we don't learn to turn this off, this unbelief is going to carry us to a place we don't want to go. And when we get there, we're going to find ourselves in trouble. How many of you know this is more than a book? Let me read something for you. This is in Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing, and effective. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and the spirit, the completeness of a person. And of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of our heart. And not a creature exists that is concealed from his sight, but all things are open and exposed and revealed to the eyes of him with whom we have to give an account. Everybody say powerful. Powerful. But if we don't believe that it's powerful then we just cast it aside and it collects dust on a table and it does us absolutely no good at all. How many of you have ever found yourself in a situation where all of a sudden, man, fear was trying to grip your heart, things were closing in on you, and you took time to open this book? I'm telling you, there have been times that I've felt the devil trying to shut me down, and I'd open that book, and I'd feel like a lion I just got inside my tank, man. It would be something that all of a sudden I'd read something that would speak to me, and I'd begin to, man, I'd, I'd just begin to raise my hands and declare, God, I believe you. Devil, you're a liar. In the name of Jesus, get behind me. There's something powerful about his word. Because in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Do you understand that He has not left us without a weapon? It's sharper than any two edged sword. And when you begin to believe this, you begin to put to rest your fears and your doubts and stand on the Word of God, there's a promise coming down your dusty road. You're getting ready to experience the hand of God work for you in ways like you've never seen it work for you before. Everybody say it, I believe. Before the monkeys ever put it on an LP, I was a believer. I was a believer. How many of you ever had God do something 
that turns you into a believer. I didn't even know who God was. But man, when he touched my heart, it was like, hey, I'm a believer now. I don't have to have someone else's opinion. I don't need to find out what so-and-so thinks. I just, heard, I just read what he said, and what he said settles it uh, whether you believe it or not. It's settled. We, people say, well, I don't believe all that. Like they're not believing it, it's going to stop it from happening. Oh, I, try that out. Climb up on this roof and get on the edge and say, I don't believe in gravity and step off and find out if gravity doesn't make a believer out of you. I'm telling you that his word is going to come to pass. So don't let fear grip your mind. Put it to rest. Don't let it, don't let it continue to churn and turn in your head. Every once in a while, you just got to make up your mind. I'm going to stand on the word of God. I don't care what else is happening around me. If he said it, I believe it. I'm going to declare it. I'm going to walk in it. I'm going to live it. I'm going to see it come to pass in my life hold on to it let his word make a believer out of you Hebrews 4 and 14 so then since we have a great high priest who has entered into heaven Jesus the son of God let us hold firmly to what we believe folks don't get that scripture so then since we have a great high priest that entered into heaven what did they do to Jesus? They crucified him. They beat him. They tortured him. They watched him draw his last breath. But death could not hold him. Do you understand? that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Greater is he that's in you than your circumstance. Greater is he that's in you than your situation. So every once in a while, you need to just take a step back and say, hang on a second here. I, I ain't done yet. Greater is he that's in me. So this is what I declare, that I shall live and not die. This is what I declare, that I am going to rise up blessed of the Lord that my children will be saved well I don't know if I can believe that well just keep on doubting and see where that gets you there's something about serving God that faith is required the Bible says that without faith it's impossible to believe him, or to please him, rather. It's, it's also impossible to believe him. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. So stop and consider this. That means that if you're looking for evidence for everything you're believing, that's not faith. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things that I don't see. If I can see it, it's not faith. It's when I can't see it and I trust him. Yeah. Right, you remember that trip we were on in Russia and nobody really knew about this. Everything started falling apart on me, man. I, it was, I, I thought, God, what's going on? I, I, I got on the bus and I was, I was really kind of bummed out. And I, you know, I wasn't sharing it with anybody, but I thought God, that there were people that were trying to manipulate my trip and, and all this. And I, I, I just, you know, I, I felt like I was hamstrung. And I went to lean against the window, and the window was closer than I thought it was. You know, so I went, I, I did one of those heavy leans, and the window was right there. It was like, pow, man. And, and all of a sudden, when I hit my head on that window, I promise you, I heard God speak to me, and he said, 
quit worrying about this. Just trust me. Within two hours, I had my own bus. Nobody could manipulate the trip anymore. God set it up where I was able to organize our trip the, the way that we felt, the way that I felt like he wanted us to do it, and he had removed every obstacle. Complaining about it doesn't make it go away. <laughs> Doubting that God's going to do anything about it doesn't make it go away. Standing up and saying, I believe you, God. I trust you, God, is your road to success and recovery. Now listen to what he says in verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize and understand our weaknesses and temptations. But one who has been tempted, knowing exactly how it feels to be human. In every respect as we are, yet without committing any sin. Did you ever hear anybody make the statement, or maybe we have, well, God just doesn't understand what I'm going through. The Bible said that he was made flesh. See, it's hard for us to think about this because every thing we've ever seen about Jesus always shows him more in his divinity than it does his humanity. So I want to encourage you to come out this Friday night because we're going to be showing part of the chosen. And what's unique about that is it shows him in his humanity. It, sees, it allows you to see him wrestle. See, we always see it like he, he, he walks past everything and nothing ever got to him. But if he's tempted in all like manner as we were, then that means there were a few times he wanted to slap Peter. Oh, come on. If he was, to, how many of, let me ask a question to be fair about this. It says that he was tempted in like manner as we are. Is there anybody in here that's ever been tempted to slap somebody? I rest my case. If, if you were tempted to do it, he felt it. Here's, here's the deal. He didn't give in to it. He never sinned. It's not a sin to feel it. It's a sin to follow through with it. Being tempted, you can, being tempted isn't the sin. It's when you give in to the temptation of sin. He felt it. He knows what it's like. And he's saying, you can rejoice because I've overcome the world. How could I rejoice if he overcome the world and he's got no connection to me? But he's saying, he became flesh. He became, do, do you get it? Do you understand that he stepped out of, he's not half God and half man. He's 100% God and 100% man at the same time. So he knows what we're going through. Now, check this out because I get excited about this. He says, Therefore, verse 16, let us therefore. Now, what's it saying? What, what's it there for? He's saying because of what you just read in verse 15. Because he knows what you feel like. Because he's been tempted the same way you are. Because he understands all that, he said, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. The word boldly there means outspoken. How many of you have ever seen somebody outspoken? It means frankness or bluntness. How many of you have ever seen anybody that was just blunt? So he, he said to come boldly where? To the throne. Throne means seat of power. Throne of what? Throne of grace. Grace means gratitude, favor, and joy. Do you understand that there is power in gratitude? There is power in favor, and there is power in joy? This is what he's telling us. He's saying, look, he's saying we should be confident in our heart that when we come to him, we're outspoken when it comes to believing in his power, his grace, in his mercy and we know in our heart uh, that he is going to help us uh, when we need it most uh, somebody say I believe you can't rest when you have unrest in your heart 
Would you stand with me today? So when you can't shut it off, when this, when this that's located between our two ears is just spinning out of control, put it to rest. Well, how do you do that? My dad knew how. Acting up, he told everybody to settle down in there and we weren't listening. 7.30 in the evening, he put it to rest. He got up and he said, every one of you get to bed right now. Are you kidding me? It's 7.30. Have you ever been a kid in the bed at 7.30? It's still daylight outside, man. I'm thinking, this, this is torture. You, you, man, you, everything's, you're looking up and you, you're looking around and, you, you know, you, you're trying to count flies on the wall. I mean, every, everything, you, you just, and then finally, because you know he's not letting you up, you begin to settle down. When we quit allowing our flesh to have the upper hand, we put it to rest. We say, no, I choose to believe God. It's my choice. I choose to trust God. Today, I'm going to ask you to come to the front of this building and I want you to come today with an understanding that God is going to take care of you. So come with no fears, no doubts, no worries, only a rest that's coming from Him that's going to settle down in our spirit and cause us and allow us to live in his presence how about it are you ready to put it to rest today I want you to come right now come right now very quickly only you know and he knows what it is that's trying to distract you so many accidents happen because of distractions I don't know how many children have lost their lives because they were texting on a phone. A distraction. A distraction. I'm sure that there are some of us in here that if we were to admit to it, while we were driving, glance down to read a text, or, and then all of a sudden felt a wheel go into the gravel. Pastor, that almost sounds like a personal experience. It almost is. <laughs> and you got to pull back on. You got to get back in control. And then you take that phone and you throw it in the seat. And you say, you know what? That nearly cost me. And that ain't worth paying that kind of price for. God help us to put it to rest today. Do you know why sometimes we struggle so much with trying to make things happen? None of us want to admit it, but it's because we don't trust God. And we feel like if we don't do it, it's not going to happen. I learned that I do a lot better if I'll bring it to God first and find out exactly what it is. I'm supposed to be doing because if when I bring it to him first he has a way of bringing it all under his control so as you stretch your hand to heaven with me right now if you, I, I want to do something a little bit different today if, if you would just reach out and take someone's hand Go ahead and take a moment to look at them. And if you would, you'll have to, you may have to look two ways here. But I want you to take a moment and say, I want you to understand 
you're not alone. You're not alone. Sometimes we feel like we're alone, but hey, you're not alone. As a matter of fact, sometimes we prefer to go it on our own. But you're not alone. God, right now in this building today, is going to wrap his arms around you. You're going to sense a gathering together in your heart and in your mind that you are not alone. You're not walking this out by yourself. Friend, he has been with you when you didn't even recognize he was with you. You don't know all the dangers he's already brought you through. You don't understand how the devil had plotted and planned and he had it set up and he was going to take you out. God said, not today. They're mine. He wants you to experience that rest. As you stretch your hands to heaven with me right now, I want to pray for you. I feel something in here today. I don't know how to explain this other than I feel a very fatherly presence in this building. I wish my arms were big enough that I could just open them up and wrap them around you and hold you because that's what I feel like God is doing right now. He's holding you. He's letting you know, I've always been there for you. I've always been present. And I want you to learn how to trust me. I want you to give it to me now. I want you to let go of it. Everybody say it with me. I let go right here, right now. Father, I thank you. We come to you today and ask you, to take complete control. We repent, Father, of those times that <laughs> we just spoke things in doubt and out of fear. I didn't even realize that it was a, an act of disbelief. It was a sin. So today, I repent of it. And I tell you from the depths of my heart, that I really do trust you. Even when I don't know what it is exactly you're doing, I trust you. And I just surrender myself to you right now. And I ask you to help me to put it to rest. I choose to let it go. I choose to say, yes, I believe. Help me now, God to strengthen the faith of others so they can believe as well. The concerns I've had with my business, with my employment, with my family, I'm not going to let them rob my peace any longer. Today, I put it to rest in your hands knowing that you're in control. I trust you with my health, with my well-being, with my life. After all, you gave it to me. It belongs to you. So I just ask you, take care of me, God. And in you taking care of me, I promise that I'm going to help take care of others. Thank you for loving us in here today. Thank you for holding us. Today, we say yes in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you give him a big hand clap of praise in this house? Did, did you feel what I felt in here? Does anybody sense that? I wonder if you would just take a moment. Maybe Debbie tells us sometimes just wrap your arms around yourself. Yes. I feel him holding us today. I know there have been some rough roads, but I want, to, I want you to understand that the best is in front of us, not behind us. Even when we don't know what the best is, 
Sometimes we think we've got it figured out. I, th I, I thought the best thing for me was to evangelize the rest of my life. I thought the best thing for me was never to pastor a church, and I was so wrong because I've experienced so much joy and love being here. I can't imagine doing anything else. I'm so glad that God's big enough that when we get it wrong, he can get a hold of our hearts and into our mind and make it right. Say it with me. God, thank you for making it right in Jesus' name.